Okay, this is engine performance test two, test 18, or chapters 18 through 20. 18 through 20. Everybody got that? All right. Let's go ahead and dive into this test right here, guys. The first fuel filter in the sock inside the fuel tank normally filters particles larger than 70 to 100 microns. Now, my question is, what's a micron? So small. What I tell you? What I, what I told you guys before that a micron was? If you took a meter, a meter is how big? A meter is how many? If you're going to take a meter and tell me how much in inches it is, how much is it? 100 microns. Huh? No, inches. How many? How many inches is a meter? One. How many inches? Yeah. About hundred. Hundred to one. No. No inches. No. Yeah. No. Inches in a meter. A meter. Is a, meter a meter. Hold me with your hands and show me how big a meter is. How much? Let me show me with your hands how big a meter is. A meter is what? Three. Three foot. Yeah. A little more. It's almost forty inches. It's thirty-nine point six inches. Okay, now take that meter, take that 39.6 inches, and cut it into a million little parts. A million even equal little parts of a meter is a, each one of those is a micron. A millionth of a meter is a, is a micron. Okay, and those microns are little teeny tiny plastic balls, is what they are, that are like a micron in diameter is what they make. And so uh, the, the cabin air filter in that mercury sable out there filters out all particles bigger than 25 microns. See what I mean? So the, you're measuring fuel filters and stuff with microns. So 70 to 100 microns is how big. Think about it, it's a millionth of a meter. How many millimeters are there in a meter? How many millimeters? Mm -hmm. A thousand. A thousand. That's exactly right. There's a thousand millimeters in a meter. Well, that's pretty cool. The metric system is based on ten. Okay, so a thousand millimeters. So how many microns are in a millimeter? Huh? A thousand. If you break a millimeter down into a thousand little parts, then that is a micron. A micron is literally a thousandth of a millimeter or a millionth of a meter. Got it? You understand that? Now there are, if you keep going smaller and smaller and smaller, there comes a place where you, where whatever you're cutting into no longer has locality. Well, it means it goes to another dimension. We're not going to talk about uh, particle physics today. Okay. Uh, what type of safety device will keep the electric fuel? Well, oh, let me back up. A uh, hundred microns is how much of a millimeter? Hundred what? Hundred microns is how much of a millimeter? Uh, a tenth of a millimeter. A tenth, yeah. Think about that. I mean, you can almost see that, you know, with your naked eye. So that sock in the t gas tank ain't stopping no particle that's all that big. Right? All right. What type of safety device will keep the electric fuel pump from operating if it's tripped? What do you mean trip? Uh, that means if the switch is triggered. Inertia switch. You know how you go bang that thing, a little button jumps up, and then your fuel pump shuts off. What vehicles have inertia switches on? Ford. And? What else? Nissan. Some Nissans have got them. Some Toyotas have got them. Um, the um, General Motors cars don't have them. You know, but. Huh? Yeah, the, uh, but you're going to find them on some Nissans. That's important for you because if you've got a no start on a Nissan and you work, work, work on it and find out it had an inertia switch, then you'll feel like a dummy, right? And you also didn't make any money. Uh, a good fuel pump should supply how much fuel per minute? 0.5 to 1 gallon. 0.5, that's right, 0.5 to 1 gallon. Uh, technician A says fuel pump modules are spring loaded so they can be compressed to fit the opening. <laughs> They're not spring loaded so you can compress them to fit the opening, please. Please. Well, think about that. The springs are this way and the well, openings, you know. Only I've ever seen a GM do that. Yeah. Well, the reason that they do it, everybody now wants to draw the fuel right off the bottom of the tank so that it'll process any water that gets in there right away. Yeah. Instead of having the fuel uh, sock, you know, an inch and a half off the bottom of the tank and it lets gallons of water gather up in there. Does it really? Yeah. I mean, because if the water goes down below what the sock can reach, you're going to wind up with a bunch of water in the tank that's taking up space. But say, now let's don't do that. Let's put it right on the bottom of the tank 
and fix it so that as the fuel pump is drawn out of there, it acts like a vacuum cleaner and any little tiny particle of water gets sucked up and dealt with. Yeah, you know? that's a good thing. Yeah, it's a great thing because that way you ain't got a ton of. It keeps the gas tank cleaner. Yeah, because that's one mine. Yeah, I mean, if they if it wasn't better, they wouldn't have done it that way. When they start doing that, probably in the late '90s, the ones that I've seen, maybe mid to late '90s, they started doing it. Some of them had done it before that, but I remember in the early '90s, some of them would have the fuel pump, you know, the bottom of the gas tank, and they had a fuel pump, uh, you know, pulling through this stiff pipe, and the little sock would be right here, and the bottom of the tank would be there. And you'd have water in here underneath that. And then when the water got enough where you go around the curve, water would slosh up and you'd get a drink of water mm -hmm. and all the <laughs> And it would do that. One time I worked on this little 88 model Cavalier that belonged to Adam Beverage Company. And somebody, and this is the biggest problem that I saw with people putting fuel pumps in, is they put that little fuel pump, fuel, that sock on that pump. And when they're working it in there, they're having a jack around and working it in, and they knock the sock off the pump. And then they say, oh, I don't care about that, and they go and stick it down in there. And then one tiny little particle of dirt gets in there and locks up that positive displacement pump and sitting by the highway. Yep. And well, this one here had a different problem. Whenever they knocked the sock off the pump, on that one, it was they had kind of started to have it closer to the bottom. And that sock was supposed to be down here pretty close to the bottom of the tank, and this little, you know, this little thing. Well, since the sock came off, the pump had this, you know, where the sock was supposed to be, a sock laid over here somewhere. And so <laughs> here I was over here uh, driving this thing, and they said, when you stop this car, it stalls. And so I'd stop the car, and oh, that's crazy. And so then I'd fire it back up. <coughs> and then when I stopped the car, I'd move like that. And so but as long as you didn't stop, you didn't have a problem. And then I also noticed, I put my fuel pressure gauge on it, and I'm watching, I got taped to the windshield. And when I stopped, I noticed the fuel pressure would go wow. almost all the way to zero and it would kill the engine and then the fuel pressure would come back up. And then I noticed, well, what if I have to back up? So I put it in reverse and when I backed up, the fuel pressure would go bad and it would stall that way. And so they stop, had, stop. And the gas was, there was just enough of a weight of the gas in here that was sloshing back and forth that this bottom of this gas tank would all can up and mm -hmm. stop it. You know, when I do like the bottom of an oil can, you go doo 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 you know what I mean? Yes. And that, that little that metal gas tank, the weight of it was having to hold it. That's the one I'll call him back. But, uh, anyway, it goes doom, and it stopped up that thing, and it would kill it. Anyway, that was this little diagnostic story there. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it was. And it, but, I mean, that was something I'll, I never saw again. But, you know, you remember those kind that you, you know, worried with. Gosh, that was had to have been in 1992 or something when that happened. Yeah, I wasn't even alive. Huh? I wasn't even alive then. Yeah, well, I know. All right. <laughs> Technician A says fuel pump modules are spring loaded so they can be compressed to fit the opening. Technician B says they're spring loaded to allow for expansion and contraction of plastic fuel tanks. Well, yes, they're. Technician B it says it's supposed to be right here, but I'm telling you, they're drawing that depth right off the bottom of the tank now. That's the reason they're doing that. On the Tauruses, they snap into a little. Um, uh, carrier in the tank click and they have flexible hoses you know the, these nylon slinky flexible hoses connect to them <laughs> all right uh, fuel pumps being tested with an amp probe and a digital storage oscilloscope now oh, wait a minute I'm, I'm back up I'm sorry the amperage draw of an electric fuel pump is higher than specified all of the following are possible causes except a corroded electrical connection corroded electrical connectors are not going to cause it to have more amp draw because they're going to, it's going to reduce the lamp draw. Fuel pumps being tested with an amp probe and a digital storage oscilloscope. Technician A says most fuel pumps have four commutator segments. Technician B says the speed of the pump motor should be higher than 3,000. Now these right here, hello, these are commutator segments. These little brass things right here. Now this particular one right here is out of a power window motor and it's got eight. You know, but fuel pump motors are smaller. And a lot of times what we don't realize is, is this a commutator spinning, driving that fuel pump, the gasoline that that thing is pumping is, is pumping right up past all of this spinning armature and all that. It's actually keeping that fuel pump wet with gas. Cool. And it cools it. Bingo. Yeah. And they started doing that on aircraft a long time ago. I was at the track one time and my sock stopped up. My fuel pump sounded like it's going to blow up. Yeah. It's, it, it screams. Now, if you got a loud fuel pump, you better be seeing if you got good fuel delivery. Mm -hmm. And I mean, because if you've got a clogged 
uh, inlet to a, any fuel pump, it's going to go rah, and be really loud. I'll go around the track and then get about half sideways and big old flame come on tail pop by the other <laughs> <laughs> Oh, backfire. That, uh, uh, we were driving in this phone company truck one time, me and the shop foreman, and uh, when we would turn the wheel, the truck would die. Then we'd straighten up, it would come back. And I'm talking about turning it a lot. I'm talking about turning it a little so you're twisting the frame a little bit. Yeah. And we go, ooh, 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 ooh. And I said, I wonder if we can just shake the truck and make this happen. And it had this one of these, sort of like a camper shell with a big rack on the top of the telephone company truck, you know, a little Ford Ranger. And so the shop foreman got the truck. And I got out beside the truck, and I started shaking it. So, and I got me some momentum going before I could really shake it good. And he was inside the truck making noises, going, stop, quit, boom, wham, boom. He's banging his head off. Like, but it never would quit like that. But every time we made it hurt, it did. And what happened on that one, it had a fuel pump on the frame that was fed by another one in the tank. And the fuel pump on the frame had this rubber boot and a spade connector. And in, if you just looked at the rubber boot that was, you know, snapped around that wire, you couldn't see anything. But it wasn't touching all the time. And when you twist the frame, it would disconnect <laughs> you know what I mean? So whenever I, you know, I felt of it, just pulled on it, it was you could pull it, and the engine would die. You know, so then plugged it on there good and put the boot back on. That's all it took to fix that one. That's the, that's what we do. See, I mean, every job you do is not going to be uh, replacing this and that and the other and putting the timing belts on and all that kind of stuff. A lot of it is you're going to be doing. I've actually fixed more vehicles than I can count by just reaching over here and grabbing the connector and went click. I've done that three times this week. Yeah, three times this week. You plug the thing in. That's what I'm telling you. It happens all the time. This man couldn't get his uh, lights to work on his trailer, and they were out on the back. Mm -hmm. I got looking at it. This ain't right. I ain't getting no fire anywhere. I went under a truck. Connector was probably about that far off. Yeah, yeah, that's all it takes. Sometimes you can unplug connectors and plug them back together and fix them. Yeah. I mean, because there'll be oxidation there that you can see. Uh, but anyway, um, the fuel filter has been accidentally installed backwards. You were asking about this. You were asking about this yesterday because you worked on one of the fuel filters that went on backwards. What is the most likely result? Low power at higher engine speeds and loads. All right. Now, it's not going to cause a no start. You had a no start, didn't you? Yeah, so he turned the fuel filter around, but I don't know. I think they're running out of gas or something. Yeah. Okay. But, um, how long does an electric fuel pump run if the ignition is turned on but the engine is not started? Five. Five. Two seconds. Two seconds. Unless, unless it's one of these uh, power stroke diesels that have electric fuel pump on it and it runs 20 seconds when you turn on the key. But on, the, on the, every, all gas burners, just about two seconds. Turn on. Huh? What? Oh, six? Oh, sorry. Uh, fuel pump being treated with an amp. Being tested with an amp probe, an amp probe and a digital an oscilloscope technician A says most fuel pumps have four commutator segments, and I stopped before I got through with that one. Yeah. Technician B says the speed of the pump motor should be higher than 3,000 RPM. That's just technician B. Now you remember what that looked like? The little commutator segments on that thing will look like this right here if it's nice and healthy. But if you see one whenever you're doing that amp probe thing, and it you know, it's doing this kind of stuff. You know, you got a fuel pump that's on the way out. Basically, what you got there. And you see that sometimes too. All right, now then, uh, let's see. Fuel pumps. Uh, some General Motors electric fuel pumps incorporate a blank that functions as a backup circuit to energize the fuel pump relay. Fuel pressure. Oil pressure switch. Oil pressure switch. Yeah. The oil pressure switch on these GM cars. Uh, actually, if you unplug the fuel pump relay, you can see what that'll do. Uh, you'll take, you'll have to spin it until the oil pressure comes up before the fuel pump will come on. That's pretty cool. You know, and I've seen that before, where I've come out of a video warehouse, and this guy's trying to start his Camaro, and it's going, and I said, that thing's probably got a bad fuel pump relay in your, you know, oil pressure switch having to carry. I don't know for a fact, but I told him to check that, you know. He said, this car's going to do that long time. Anyway, technician A says a pressure check valve should hold system pressure for at least five minutes after the pump is shut off. Technician B says a defective check valve will cause long cranking time. Hey guys, smell the roses. What's going on with our Dodge? Okay, yeah. you got that? And uh, you park that thing, it does that. So, uh, oh Dodge. Huh? That What's caravan that? out there. What's that? That caravan out there, yeah. And she come over here and, she, and when it's cold, it just spins, 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 spins. And it finally starts, it runs good. And uh, so, but anyway, uh, another thing it causes, remember I told you about that 
uh, Nissan Altima that had somebody had pulled a fuse out of and it wasn't didn't the PCM didn't know it was in start mode and it wasn't put enough fuel in there to start it. Yeah. It was putting about as much as it would put in there if the engine was idling, which was not enough to start it because you got to let the manifold good when it's cold. That's why you had an accelerator pump, you know, and a choke on the other. Uh, which sensor has the greatest influence on the pulse width of the nope. injector besides the mass airflow, the throttle position? And not only not only on the pulse width, but I'm telling you, a lot of these engines will add extra squirts in between the regular ones. The squirt triggers, the triggers that are that are triggered by the crank will be supplemented by additional triggers that whenever you're cracking the throttle. When the throttle is moving, you'll act, if you could watch it on a square wave, you'd see additional squirts, typically. And the only reason I knew that was because on that service bag diagnostic system, we were able to look at the uh, fuel pulse and square wave form, you know, which is really, most, most tools don't even show you that. Okay, uh, let's see. But you'll hear them. Sometimes you'll hear the injectors going Bleh. You know, they buzz more when they do that, depending on the software and the engine controller. Let's get number 11 uh, Which one, number 11? Yes. Why are some fuel fuel rails rectangular in shape? I have no clue. I've always wondered that. They reduce noise. Oh. What, what's the shape of the fuel rail on the neon? It's circular. It's square. I mean, it's around. It's a tube, and they're noisier. You ever know, you asked her about a, full, a pulsation damper in the fuel system? Yeah. You know what they look like? Just like Real similar, except it ain't got a, some of them will have a vacuum line hooked to it, most of them don't. And uh, that basically, but the Ford's have it's like, yeah, it does. It's like jumping on a trampoline <laughs> so that you don't hear the fuel lines bouncing every time the injectors fire. They don't want to hear the, the fuel lines going click, 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 click. I like to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what type of fuel injection system uses a fuel temperature and or pressure sensor? Electronic returnless. Electronic returnless dampers are used on some fuel rails to reduce noise. That's what I just said. Where is the fuel pressure regulator located on a vacuum biased port fuel injection system? No clue. At the outlet of the fuel rail. It's right the, the return line that goes back to the tank is coming right out of that fuel pressure regulator in most cases, right? Uh, which statement is correct? Dirt is more likely to be found near the bottom of the fuel tank. <laughs> oh. That's not complicated, is it? Which term is used to describe pulses of air flowing from the engine out of the air intake due to the time interval between intake events on a four-cylinder engine? Wow. Pulses of air flowing from the engine out the air intake due to the time interval between intake events. Reverse airflow is what you call that. In other Why do some of them have two fuel pressure regulators? Uh, well, they typically they won't have two fuel pressure regulators unless it's got some sort of a split system there. And the other one usually you see will not be a fuel, if it's a, a lot of times you'll have a vacuum line hooked to a damper. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't know, I've I never, that's what it is on like Q45. yeah, I've never really been able to definitively say why they hook a vacuum line to some of those dampers. I'm sure some of the, so what happens if I took that out? I don't think it would be a big deal. It wouldn't do nothing? Probably wouldn't change anything. Inside? You can disconnect a vacuum line from a fuel pressure regular on a regular car, it ain't gonna change much. I know that. And they just did away with those things after a while. I mean, but make it run a little rich. But yeah, but very little. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's it won't even change your fuel trim most of the time. Really? Yeah, very little. I mean, I, I don't know if I've ever seen a uh, I don't know if I've ever seen that make that much of a difference. Well, what, what causes them to open up once the, huh? if it doesn't have the vacuum on? The pressure for the fuel. Uh, okay. I mean, the pressure of the fuel pushing on the bottom of the diaphragm is going to open it up. And it reduces the amount of fuel pressure required to open it when you got vacuum on there. Yeah. So it's just basically a little helper there. Which term described? But I will tell you this, though. Sometimes you'll have one that's running rich. And whenever you got one that's running rich, you can tap on the fuel pressure and the fuel pressure jump to 100 pounds. Yeah. I've seen that happen more than once. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which term describes the PCM shutting off the ejection when the accelerator is pressed all the way to the floor? I don't know what it's called, but I know what it does. Clear flood mode. Clear flood, clear flood. Why, would that, why, is, why do they even put that in there? Why? Yeah. Because you drive a rotary motor? You're drying the spark plugs. The spark plugs get wet. Do the spark plugs fire when they're wet? No, the spark runs on the wet. So if you want to dry them off to where they'll start firing on the wet, you push your pedal all the way to the floor, shuts off the injectors, all that air puffing in there, dries the plugs to where they'll start firing. And in, when you're in clear flood mode, when you're in clear flood mode, listen to this, you actually, let me get over this little bit of a burp here. Uh, when you're in clear flood mode, if the engine RPM goes above 
about 400 is going to catch. All right, now let me ask you this. What if I took uh, a little resistor or a jumper wire or something, and I went out here to one of the cars for a bug during engine performance? Because you guys are going out to fix several cars, right, during engine performance. Final. I mean, I'll have several of them lined up, and you got a certain amount of time to find a problem. And if you don't, you just crash and burn all the way down the line. So, uh, but anyway, and there'll be hard problems too, you know. Anyhow. So listen, this is what I'm gonna. What if I took and I says I'm gonna jimmy this wiring on here, like by going from reference voltage to the signal, and I'm gonna make it read wide open throttle all the time. What's that gonna cause? But it's not gonna start. Yeah, and it'll be a very simple problem. And if you're not really careful. You'll go in there and you'll look all up and down and everything and you'll say, my goodness, what am I seeing? If I make it an in-range, if I get a resistor so that I can make it an in-range failure of that oxygen sensor, I mean of that throttle position sensor, so that it's in clear flood mode and that car's been sitting there and there's no gas puddled up in the manifold for it to pick up. Which a lot of times if you hold a gas pedal all the way to the floor, even though it doesn't have injector squirt, it'll have gas puddled up in the manifold, it'll mist that in there and it'll fire up. If it, over, if it goes over 400, it's going to start running. See, but it's, what's it spinning? How fast is it spinning when you spin it over? About 175 RPM, maybe 200 tops. Uh, and so I'm sitting here, and you're sitting, eh, nothing you do makes any difference. Eh, won't start. You see? If you got to hit 400, it would do it, though. You couldn't, if you, unless you had some reason, some way of making it go to 400. And your starter ain't going to do that. It ain't going to spin it fast to 400. Uh, but anyway, just keep that in mind. That is a possibility. I, you would be surprised how many times I've seen that. I, I mean, back in the olden days, whenever uh, fuel injection was young, I would go to somebody's house that was just, you know, some friend of mine that had a car that wouldn't start. And you spin it over, spin it over, there's no fuel injection. Unplug the throttle position sensor and it fires up. <laughs> because the throttle position sensor was reading wide open throttle had the injectors cut off. Did you, if you did not understand that, you'd be like other other yo-yos that had looked at his car and couldn't fix it. See what I mean? But you kind of learned that uh, early on. So just, I mean, all I'm, you know, I'm trying to get you guys to think like mechanics, right? Right. Got that? Yeah. The braking. Yep. And uh, you ought to get Matt to give you a rundown on how we found out what was wrong with an Eon and making it run rough. Hey, did you bug it again? Uh, no, but I will. But it needs to be bugged again for Zach because he needs to fight with it like the other guy, like you other guys did. He fought with it. He fought with it. Yeah. And, uh, but you got to bug. I got to bug it so that he won't get lucky. You know what I mean? So I don't want him getting lucky. I want him to track it down. Where is the fuel injected in an engine equipped with gasoline direct injection? Oh, wait a minute. Excuse me. Which term describes PCM? Uh, oxygen sensor feedback to control fuel delivery. Closed loop mode. Where is the fuel injected in an engine uh, equipped with gasoline direct injection Which directly into the combustion chamber? Here. He's a well, 20. I was talking about clear flood mode. That was 19. I know. That's a that's, that's a you don't even okay. It's not, uh, on 17, whenever you did the reverse airflow, uh -huh. instead of circling reverse airflow, I circled the number 17. <laughs> Outstanding. And then you skip 18, and then you did 19, yeah. and then you did 19. I know she was the getting answer. Answer. Uh, technician A says vehicles with electronic returnless fuel system use pulse width modulation to power the fuel pump and maintain fuel pressure. Technician B says the electronic returnless fuel system uses a power transistor control of fuel pump. Both those guys are right. Now, so 19B, right? Yeah. Are you sure? 19B. Sure? I know, but I think he was really talking about number 20. No, 20 is D. 20 is dog. So 20 is dog and 19 is B yeah. or C? Yeah. Well, think about this. <laughs> the PCM using oxygen sensor feedback to control fuel delivery is not clear flood mode. Okay. You gotta look you at the question. Yeah. Open loop no, open loop. that's whenever it shuts off the fuel injector. Oh. Now remember what I told you about the way that thing was tight. When you let off the gas and you're coasting, it shuts off the fuel injectors then too. It shuts off the fuel injectors when you're coasting. Okay. Now, what causes an engine to diesel when you shut it off? Keep running. Keep running. Carbon caking. Mm -hmm. Carbon caking. That is one thing that can cause that, and that's a good point. If there's gasoline still in there and you got glowing red coals on that carbon, it can, it's going to keep lighting off that gas. What's another thing? Huh? What's another thing? Another thing, it's well to begin with, it's got to have gas in it. And a carburetor, if you had a carburetor where it was idled up too high, 
yeah. and it could still pull in, keep pulling gas in there uh, after you shut off the engine. And it was a good hot engine. It was it would go. You might have even heard it. She said it also would go doom 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 doom. Keep trying to run. That's when it's doing it. Another thing is if you've got a vacuum leak, it can do that. And it'll be pulling fuel in there that's you know misted it up on the inside of the manifold. But I had a Ford Explorer that had electronic fuel injection, full electronic fuel injection, more than one of these. They came in there, and when you shut those things off, they would diesel. I was like, how the Sam Mill is this possible? We ain't got no carburetor. They might be in an air leader. Or not. <laughs> you know, they have, this is like a 91, 92 mile explorers, and I was thinking that thing through. And what I found out was that each power relay was sticking. The what? The power relay that powers up the fuel injectors, the engine controller, and everything the PCM controls. It was sticking. And when I say sticking, you shut off the ignition, you're killing the coils. Because that comes directly from the ignition switch. On that one, you shut it off. If the heat power relay is hung and it's still feeding power to the injectors and everything, the injectors, the PCM is still awake, and it's still thinking, I need to keep running. It doesn't know the ignition's been shut down. Okay? It's still seeing a crank signal because it's still awake, and it's still going squirt, 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 squirt. <laughs> you know, the injectors are still powered up, and it's still operating the injectors. So while the ignition system has been shut down, the injector, the fuel injection system is still squirting gas because the PCM thinks it's supposed to. And the engine keeps turning because it's diesel and doop to doop doop to doop doop. That's the craziest thing I'd heard. But I mean, it wasn't that hard to fix. I, if it wouldn't do that, then I'd just say, switch it off, get my test light, go to idle air control, it's still hot, boom, thump that relay, <coughs> it goes dark, put a relay in there, you know, and uh, you put it outside. Right? And that's what. Uh, you know, of course, the ticket's written up. You know, they're going to pay an hour and a half for us to check it anyway on that one. On fuel problems like that. And so that would be a quick, that's a quick fix that, you know, was not that hard. But the first time I saw it, it was like I was, wow, this is incredible. But then after, every time I saw it after that, it wasn't. There's all kind of crazy stuff I've never understood. I was telling Wes the other day, on you know, some of those four-liter single-red single cam engines in them, like, late 90s Explorers, they would come in there and they would be skipping on number four, and it would be a bad spark plug. And these wouldn't have very many miles on them. It was like if you drop in a cylinder, it would be number four, consistently be number four. I don't know why number four was always failing and all the plugs were screwed in there at the same time. And uh, I've replaced, and I got to the point where somebody tell me, I got an explorer over here skipping. I said, put a number four spark plug in and see what that does. They put one in there, hey, that fixed it. <laughs> I mean, across the shop, I could tell them which spark plug was bad. And they were like, this guy's a genius, you know. <laughs> but that was because it was always the same one, you know, some skew. But, uh, but I told my buddy Donnie about it. I said, Donnie, I don't know why I've seen so many of the spark plugs on number four. He said, and this is weird, too. He said, I ain't seen any of those. I said, well, you're going to. He said, well, why, why would it always be number four? I don't know, but it is. And so he pulled one in. He said, I got one of these explorers over here. We're going to check this out. I said, well, just let me know what you find. So I saw him in there at the parts counter getting a spark plug later. And I said, which cylinder was it, Donnie? He went, four. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want to tell me it was four because he was his contention was no. But then later on he goes, hey, I did see one that was cylinder number five. I said, what, one among a hundred? You know, you see, just about every one of them was four. But what we also we went to school sometimes, we talked to other mechanics that worked at Ford dealerships all over the country. And I say, we're having throttle position sensors crapping out left and right on these Ford Aerostars. And the guys in Tennessee would say, well, we're not seeing any of that, but we're having mass airflow sensors dropping like flies. Really? We haven't seen any of those. I mean, they're all the same vehicle. They come from the same place. Why are the <laughs> TP sensors failing in Alabama and the mass airflow sensors failing in Tennessee? And, and other people that I talked to, mechanics that would go to school, I said, ask about that. And they found out that they were having a different kind of failure than we were. I just, I don't know if that's true on all kinds of cars, but it was on the ones we were working on at the time. Okay, boy, did I ever get on a rabbit trail. Um, the fuel pump inside the tank on a vehicle equipped with the gasoline direct injecting produces what kind of pressure? D. 50 to 60 PSI. Quit skipping. High pressure fuel pump used in a gasoline uh, direct injecting system is powered by the camshaft. And high pressure fuel pressure is regulated using an electric pressure control valve. Now this is, you're getting up close to diesel pressures here, right? You got that? Uh, well, I say 20 that. 20 and 21. Yeah, huh? 20 and 21. 20 and 21. Oh, did I jump over those? What term describes, 20 and 21. What term describes the PCM using oxygen sensor feedback? That's closed loop. We did that already. Okay. What's the fuel inject, uh, what's the, excuse me, why, where is the fuel injected in an engine uh, 
equipped with GDI, which is gasoline direct injection, directly into the combustion chamber. On our other ones, is right behind the intake valve. Okay, that's where it puts it in there. Uh, high pressure fuel regulators using electric regulator we control valve. We've already seen that. GDI you know, operate under 500 to 2900 psi. Really? Yep. Fuel injectors used on a gasoline direct injection system are pulsed using 50 to 90 volts. Really? 50 to 90 volts. Yep. I'm telling you, like the old, the old power stroke diesel used to have 115 volt injectors on it. And the wire harness had red tape around it. You didn't go probing that with a test like <laughs> latch you up. Or, <laughs> and uh, hey, it happens. Uh, what mode of operation results in a richer air fuel mixture near the spark plug? Stratified. Stratified. Some engines that use gasoline direct injection also have port fuel injection. Wrong. wrong. Actually, that's right. True. Wrong. Some of you guys are supposed to call me down when I call that one wrong. That's actually true. 28 is true. 29 is true. Gasoline direct injection system we use to start an engine without a starter. What? How oh. so? Oh, listen Damn. to that. Use the lighter. A gasoline, can you start it without a starter? Um, if it shoots no. it straight into a cylinder that's at the right spot, it, why not? Yeah. It sounds feasible. Yeah, you, I mean, if the GDI system knows exactly where every oh. cylinder is and what stroke it's on. You got me? Whenever the engine stops, it knows where everything's at. Okay. Gas, spark, bam, and we're running. Now, I've seen that on a regular old, you know, when you turn on these old, the old DuraSpark system, when you turn those car, when you turn that key on, that DuraSpark system is going to have one spark. It's going to pop one spark. I mean, like we've seen it, you know, where you're checking spark and all, trying to find out, you turn it on, pop, it sparks one time. Hey, that's cool. Well, I have seen it work. It just so happened that the right cylinder had some gas mist in it, and it was basically on the compression stroke you know, up at the top of the compression stroke, and you turn it on and the rotor happens to be pointing at the right place, like on a 306, you turn it on, <coughs> engine's running all of a sudden, what? How did this happen? You know? <laughs> I mean, it's spooky if you didn't expect it, but you can't get it to do it every time. Everything, it was like a roll of the dice, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, there was a fairly easy chance, you know, that it was, it was about to fire anyway. See what I mean? Because where's the rotor whenever, the, whenever you're top dead center compression, you're right at about, the, the rotor's within firing range of that, Post is going out of that thing, and so you turn it on, the coil lights off one spark that goes over here, and it goes through that spark plug wire to that cylinder, <coughs> and you got an engine that's running whenever you never even touch a starter. GDI equipped engines have a higher efficiency due to higher compression ratio. 30. 30. A lack of power from an engine equipped with gasoline direct injection could be due to carbon on the injectors or carbon on the intake valves, B and C. All right. Gasoline direct injection is also known as SIDI. No, I already said that. Uh, you read the question. You read it. Higher compression. Yeah, it's higher compression. Yeah, that's a D. That's a C. Thirty-one is C. Okay. Uh, let's see. Thirty-three. An engine equipped with GDI may have a twenty-five percent improvement over fuel economy. That's pretty significant if you're getting. Uh, 30 miles to the gallon, what's 25% of 30? What's 25% of 30? Less than 10. 25% of 30 would be like, uh, like 8? Yeah. Very close. Hey, he's, like, he's good. Like 7. Yeah, 7 and a half, right? So what's, what's you know, 25% of 30 would be, 25% of 60 is what? 25% of 60 is 15. 15, so you're going to have that. Right. You got that. You guys learn to do math in your head, okay? Some of you guys are still in high school. There's no excuse for it. Oh. Throw the calculator down, throw it down. Boy, throw it down. Throw that calculator down. Okay. No, they tell us to use calculators. Yeah. Oh, I'll Scientists sure. like them. Yeah, they encourage uh, us to graphic, use graphic calculators. Yeah. They said if we don't get, they, they said if we didn't get one for pre cal last year that we weren't going to make it through. Mm -hmm. I didn't use calculator except for humongous they, numbers. Well, okay. they were, they're used to people that are not as smart as you. See, that's what exactly. Happened. Exactly. Out there at the hillbilly, Elementary school in uh, Slocum, they forced a calculator on my little brother from the time he was in like the second grade till, uh, until he left. And uh, I mean, he was going into high school and didn't know how to dang, didn't know a thing, multiplication tables and all that crap. That's bad news. That's good. I taught my daughter her multiplication tables in one night when she was in the fourth grade. 
she knew them from ten, from 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 one to twelve. Uh, and one night, I taught her them, and I taught her the same way my third grade teacher taught me. We had to write those suckers down six times and turn them in that morning. Yep. Yeah. We knew them. We well, had to do it. Ain't hard to learn. Uh, S I, you know, you got to put some energy into it. S I D I high pressure fuel pump uses a single barrel piston plunger that is driven by a three lobed cam. This is interesting stuff here, isn't it? You don't heard this before, have you? Uh -uh. When the fuel pressure regulator is deactivated, the fuel pressure defaults to what? Low pressure mode. Low pressure mode. Got that? The PDI system operating in stratified mode results in a rich air fuel mixture near the spark plug tip. Yeah. 36. If it's operating in stratified mode. What GDI operating mode is used to burn sulfur from the NOx catalyst? B. Stratified heating mode. Yeah. And which component in this GDI high pressure pump is the pressure regulator? Which D. component in this GDI a. high pressure pump is the regulator? It's like a or D. It's A. Okay. It's A. Or D. Well, look at it. It's a solenoid, y'all. Oh, okay. And it's actually done electronically. You got it? Okay. Yeah. Good. Very good. All right, we're done with that. Hey. Work hard. Work hard. Work hard.